Welcome to the first installment in the OSS Society's 2021 Oh So Social Conversation Series. I'm Charles Pink, president of the OSS Society, and on its behalf, I'm pleased to welcome you to the first in a year-long series of Oh So Social Conversations. The name for this series was inspired from the fact that so many OSS personnel were members of the Social Register. It was said the initials OSS really stood for Oh So Social. And that's why we're asking everyone in attendance tonight to practice oh so social distancing. Thank you for responding so enthusiastically to our series. We have more than 1400 people registered for tonight's discussion. And we're honored to bring you leaders from the defense, intelligence and special operations communities. Tonight, we're very fortunate to have two revered figures joining us, Secretary James Mattis and the Honorable Mike Vickers. Feel free to submit questions using the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen, and please include your affiliation. Following their discussion, noted author and cocktail historian Philip Green will present this evening's drink, the Gimlet. You'll find the recipe for it on the online event page. It's easy to remember the two ingredients, gin and juice. Think of the song by Snoop Dogg. Following Phil's presentation, we're gonna share two short films with you, including an award-winning documentary produced for last year's William J. Donovan Award Dinner about the Marines who served in OSS and Secretary Mattis's military career. I'd like to thank our series sponsor, Fiserv, and the sponsors of tonight's event, the Walsingham Group, Inkitel, and BCG Federal. And to the hundreds of people who are with us tonight, thank you for supporting the OSS Society. We hope you'll join us for the next installment in our series on March 25th, when former Assistant Secretary of State for INR, the Honorable Ellen McCarthy, We'll interview best-selling author Erica Roebuck about the OSS's Virginia Hall, the subject of her new book, An Invisible Woman. It's now my honor to introduce the Honorable Michael Vickers, who will be our moderator this evening. Dr. Vickers' career as a special operator, a CIA operations officer, national security policymaker, and intelligence community leader has spent the last two decades of the Cold War through a decade and a half of our war with Al Qaeda, its allies and offshoots, service that saw unprecedented senior tenure across Republican and Democratic administrations. Most recently, Dr. Vickers served as the Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, exercising authority, direction, and control over the National Security Agency, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, the National Reconnaissance Office, the Defense Security Service, and the intelligence components of the military services and combatant commands. He's received the nation's highest awards in the fields of intelligence and defense, including the Presidential National Security Medal and the OSS Society's William J. Donovan Award. Dr. Vickers has written a memoir that will be published by Knopf Pen Penguin Random House this year. He currently serves as an executive vice president at InQtel, a principal with the Telemus Group, a senior advisor to the Boston Consulting Group, a senior fellow at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, as an honorary chair of the OSS Society and on several additional corporate, nonprofit, and governmental boards. He holds a BA from the University of Alabama, an MBA from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, and a PhD from Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Vickers would certainly have met the criteria for what was described as an ideal OSS candidate, a PhD who can handle himself in a bar fight. Due to the virtual nature of tonight's event, I'm confident there won't be any bar fights. So please welcome Mike Vickers. Thank you, Charles, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first in our series of 2021 OSO Social Conversations. This evening, we will discuss strategy, war, intelligence, special operations, and leadership with General and former Secretary of Defense, James Mattis. General Mattis was raised in Southeastern Washington and graduated from Central Washington State College. He served over 40 years in the Marine Corps as an infantry officer, plus duty in the office of the Secretary of Defense, as NATO Supreme Allied Commander and as Commander of U.S. Central Command, comprised of 250,000 troops and, uh, and allied tr U.S. and allied troops in combat across the Middle East and South Asia. Subsequently, he served as our nation's 26th Secretary of Defense from January 2017 through December 2018. In 2019, General Mattis received the William J. Donovan Award from the OSS Society 
which recognizes an individual who has rendered distinguished service to the United States of America and demonstrates the exceptional characteristics and achievements of General Donovan. In his 2019 memoir, Call Sign Chaos, Leading to Lead, um, he, he describes leadership um, and, and, and lessons of war um, from the direct leadership level to the executive to the strategic. And here it is, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I highly recommend it for its many insights on leadership, war, and strategy. For nearly half a century, General Mattis was always where America needed him most, from battalion, brigade, and division command and combat to our commander in the Middle East and then our Secretary of Defense. His leadership is the stuff of legend, his mastery of operational art unsurpassed. He won his battles and campaigns and stands at the summit of the greatest military leaders our nation has produced over the past several decades. As Secretary of Defense, his steadfast leadership and strategic confidence reassured Americans and allies alike as he began redesigning our military and defense establishment for the challenges of great power competition. Like General Donovan, he knows the vital contribution our allies make to America's security. And also like General Donovan, he understands the critical importance of intelligence as our nation's first line of defense and the roles and contributions of our special operations forces as a critical force multiplier. General Mattis, welcome to our OSO Social Conversation. Hey, thanks, Michael. It's, it's good to be here. I'm happy at least one of us has that PhD for the bar fight, but uh, I think we both got one good fight left in us. One more time into the fray, my friend. Um, all right, the Biden administration, we're gonna begin with national security challenges and US strategy. The Biden administration has come into office at a difficult time, perhaps the most difficult that has confronted uh, any president since FDR in 1932. Let's begin by talking about the challenges America will face in the decade ahead, how U.S. strategy should prioritize and respond to these threats, and what role our allies should play in our strategy. Most national security analysts describe our current and emerging national security environment is principally characterized by great power competition, most notably with China, and revolutionary technological change that promises to fundamentally, fundamentally transform both wealth and power. There's also, but there's also a revanchist Russia with its aggressive use of information warfare, hybrid warfare, and an escalate to de-escalate strategy should overt war break out. And then there's the continued proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, particularly by North Korea and Iran, the continued, albeit currently reduced threat from global jihadists, and the growing threat from white nationalists and other domestic extremists. There are also a number of challenges arise, arising from the downsides of globalization and technological change, ranging from pa pandemic disease to economic dislocation and identity politics. And there's also the growing threat of climate change. So General Mattis, how would you characterize our, our principal challenges? And more importantly, how would you prioritize them? Well, you're using the right word there, Mike, because strategy is all about prioritization. I mean, that's really what you do when you set out a strategy. <clears throat> and coming into the job as Secretary of Defense, uh, a job I'd never aspired to, I was confronted with the need to come up with a more current strategy at the same time, we're working on our national security strategy. Looking at external threats right now, I would say that terrorism is an ambient threat. It's going to be out there. It's just like the air we breathe. It's going to be something we have to deal with throughout our lifetimes, probably through the lifetimes of our children's generation. Uh, it's, uh, it's a reality in the globalized world. Uh, I think it's also one, however, that we're going to have to be very careful that we don't surrender all of our constitutional way of life as we confront it. Uh, you can't have a risk-free life in this world. It's out there, it's not going away, but it's probably not the threat that's gonna change our way of life if we can keep uh, weapons of mass destruction out of their hands. So that's going to be a continued uh, challenge for our special operations and intelligence forces. They're gonna to have to keep their eye on the ball even as we shift to the great power competition. And there, when you set up the priorities, I would use urgency, 
power, and will. North Korea remains an urgent problem. There is no doubt about it. You have an unaccountable ruler, mercurial in many ways. Uh, I don't think he's completely nuts, uh, but he verges on that. And it's not in the world's best interest to have that missile and nuclear technology in the hands of this guy. So we're going to have to deal with that. The new administration uh, is going to be confronted probably with challenges there in the Northwest Pacific early on. In terms of power, it's Putin's Russia, and you can't wish Putin away. He's going to be there for the foreseeable future. And in this case, he's the only guy who changed borders in Europe by force of arms since World War II. He's mucked around in our election, the elections of other democracies, uh, assassinated or tried to assassinate political foes. We're going to have to deal with it. And one of the best ways to look at this, so we don't think we're just... Uh, kind of talking into an echo chamber, is look at some of the serious democracies nearby. And I would use Sweden and Finland uh, to give a little bit of an exclamation point here. <clears throat> here you have two nations that during the Cold War to this day never joined NATO, tried to find a way to live alongside Russia. In Sweden's case, recently they have embarked on a 40% increase in their defense budget. And this is purely focused on Russia. This is not a NATO self-licking ice cream cone that can be dismissed by those who want another reset with Russia. Finland has reinstituted uh, conscription, for example, uh, living right next door to a Russia that still owns 10% of Finnish territory going back to the, uh, the Winter War there prior to World War II. Uh, but it's still a weak hand that, uh, that President Putin is playing economically. It's a very weak hand. And in some ways that makes it a near-term threat because perhaps the clock is ticking and when he knows he will not be able to maintain his military buildup that he's been embarked on for some years now. But when you come to Will, and I would call Will the, the, political, uh, the, the political capacity and the willingness to use the military capacity in a political way and use economics and use uh, propaganda. The challenge, of course, is China. Uh, we had numerous uh, years in the American uh, view of China where both Republican and Democrat administrations wanted to see China rise. They wanted to rise as a responsible stakeholder, they called it, and that's not what's happened. Uh, certainly, we dealt with the problems in the South China Sea, but over the last eight months, for reasons I cannot explain, I don't understand what the vulnerability is that's driven President Xi to crack down harder in Hong Kong, uh, dismiss international concerns over the human rights abuses on the Uyghurs, to increase a muscular approach to Taiwan, uh, to have an economic and cyber war on Australia, to start putting out words that the COVID vaccines of the West are, are suspect here, that this is uh, breaking strong on the internet right now. Clearly what we have is a much more adversarial China for reasons that, uh, that aren't completely understandable right now. Although if you look at the ideology of the CCP, you can see the origins of what's called now wolf diplomacy. So I think those would be the, the international security issues, certainly pandemics and things like this are going to have to be countered in when you look at what they've done uh, to our, our economy. But there's also internal threats right now, not really under the Secretary of Defense, wouldn't be in my bailiwick, but the lack of unity on the consensual underpinnings of our democracy. And what we saw on January 6th, fomented by a, a sitting president, and then the, the national debt and the skyrocketing of the national debt. These are internal problems that I would classify with every bit as much gravity as, as the external problems and perhaps more so uh, if you go back through our history and look at uh, what this does in other nations and what it's done to our nation when we went through periods like this. So that's really a, a tour de force about how to uh, think about uh, and prioritize our national security threats, and including the uh, incredible importance of getting our, our own house in order, particularly to compete with China, but also to deal with these many threats. 
So let's just talk a bit more about the, the, th the challenge posed by a rising China. Uh, it's become an economic and technological competitor of the first rank, and the importance of economics and technology to strategy seems greater than ever and central to this competition. So in a few words, how should we posture ourselves going forward to successfully compete with a rising China, given certainly that their growth trajectory has been greater than ours and that they certainly have uh, four times the population? Right, well, the first three words, a few of the few words I'd give are allies, allies, and allies. Uh, we are going to have to get with like-minded nations, nations that believe that, <clears throat> that uh, I would say the rule of law and a rules-based order <clears throat> is more in their in their favor than is a power-based uh, model, such as we see the Chinese promoting at home. They have an authoritarian model at home. We should anticipate their external uh, model will not be a lot different. Generally, we treat our own people as well or better than we treat others. They are treating their own people with a high degree of authoritarianism. Uh, I think, too, we see a, a tribute state-like approach <clears throat> to those states around them. You pay tribute to the great nation. You surrender your sovereignty in terms of economic, uh, political, security uh, decisions to the Chinese. You don't do anything to upset them or they'll go after you. And we see this going on more and more now. Uh, we, we saw the attack by the Chinese soldiers on the Indian soldiers on the border. Uh, we see more threats of this sort of thing. And you have to look at it and say, why are they doing this right now? Since they were having a pretty good run, as you point out. But I think, Mike, one thing we have to look at in a, in a highly uncertain world, uh, one of the least uncertain things, one of the things we can almost calculate years in advance is demographics. And China has an upside down demographic and they are going to have serious social contract problems and internal problems that come from the one child law from years ago. I don't know if that's what's driving this right now, but certainly the way to approach it is to get with nations that need the rule of law, that look at the prosperity and the freedom of the Indo-Pacific as elementary to their own people's uh, security, and their own people's freedom, and start working together in economic and diplomatic areas to try to rein in some of the information uh, or the intellectual property theft, the bullying aside of other nations, uh, sailors in the South China Sea, uh, fishermen, all this stuff that's going on is going to have to be addressed probably along the lines of cooperate with them where we can, hopefully on COVID, now that we got the WHO team in finally a year later, uh, global warming, climate change, nuclear proliferation, but we're also going to have to confront China where we must, and that's going to have to become increasingly part of our, our priorities in the world. So I want to come back to the changing role but continued importance of allies a bit later. Let's turn to Russia, uh, which you've described mm -hmm. in terms of power as our greatest near-term threat, but maybe not so much a long-term threat. Um, Russia is the foremost practitioner of the war on truth, and they and others are giving truth a good go of it. How should we posture ourselves to deal with this increasingly aggressive uh, uh, Russia that seeks to undermine our will through information warfare, attack states on its periphery, and exploit security vacuums farther afield? Yeah, I, you, you summed it up uh, just very, very well there. I think one thing to do is not to fall back into the idea it's like the old Cold War. Every situation is unique. <clears throat> and as you look at Putin, I think right now what you're looking at is really uh, a creature out of Dostoevsky. You see a man who is fearful of a Russia surrounded by, by threats. Uh, in their history, they have reasons to fear the Mongols, the Swedes, the French, the Germans. And you see this coming out. I, you know, if I was to rewrite this, I would remind Russia probably the only country in the world that can help them right now is America. China wants them as a rump state, as an extraction place, a way for a plate for expansion. Uh, Europe is scared to death of them. America is the one country that can help them. And that's never going to happen under Putin. It's just not going to happen. 
So we're going to have to deal with it. Uh, the number one way you deal with it is NATO. Uh, word come right back to the forefront, allies, allies, allies. The old Marine idea that if you're going into a gunfight, take all your friends with guns. Well, if you're going into a diplomatic fight, bring all your friends with diplomats. Uh, and we're going to have to confront Russia's uh, violation of sovereignty. They're actually violating sovereignty along the lines of China, but in a very different way with little green men, uh, with uh, you know surrogates and proxies and this sort of thing, uh, attacking uh, democratic processes like elections. And I think what we're going to have to do here, as Condoleezza Rice used to tell us when we were all brand new generals and she was Secretary of State, we had to go over and we get a class from her. And I didn't realize Condoleezza Rice's finger was 27 inches long, but she wagged her finger at us like the school marm that she is and said, and you remember you generals, we do things with our allies, not to our allies. And I think that is critical right now that we fall back on, an, on this kind of leadership because America's at its best when it's a team player. That's when we really bring a lot to bear. And I think right now, uh, I got over enjoying public humiliation, I think in second grade, we've got to find a way to work with our allies on this. And when you look at the increased spending in NATO, it starts in 2014 on defense, 2014. So they had already recognized the challenge coming out of Crimea, out of uh, the Donuts Basin there, that they were going to have to do more. Now they've, they're democracies and they take a while to get on board. And back as far back as John F. Kennedy, he was angry at the Europeans freeloading on, on us for security. But the message I carried to Europe when I went there was, you know, I'd been there as a Supreme Allied Commander. <clears throat> I'd heard American presidents come there from both parties and say, you can't expect us to keep carrying a disproportionate share of the load. And I said, it's now manifested politically. And I cannot go back to America, I told him as the, minute, as the Secretary of Defense, and say, we need to care more about your children's future freedom than you're willing to care. You're going to have to step up. It was done rather brusquely with some, uh, you know, some language that's unfortunate, but the bottom line is NATO's stepping up. And I think that is key to making certain that Russia is circumscribed, that they're, they're contained from doing more of what they've tried doing there and what they've done in Georgia and Ukraine, and they've tried to do elsewhere. But at the same time, I think uh, there's a way to do it, and it's following George Washington's approach to leadership. Very boring that it is, but he would listen, he, uh, and he would listen with the idea he could be persuaded. We need to listen to allies. We need to learn from them. Then we need to help them. Then we need to lead them. We got to get back into that role because it, this is a much more serious situation, I think, than has been given full uh, attention in the public. You earlier mentioned terrorism as an ambient threat that we'll be dealing with a long time to keep uh, jihadist groups from um, reconstituting. And that's one of the areas where we have had considerable success is against um, global jihadists. Now, one of the things you would expect in the return to great power competition is competition for influence in, in the third world. Um, so you, you resign uh, for, um, among other reasons, because of President Trump's uh, abrupt decision to withdraw US troops from Syria. Do we need to maintain a small continuing presence in Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, and other areas to prevent global jihadists from reconstituting? Well, the idea that there's gonna be some kumbaya moment when they all decide they're not gonna continue their mayhem I think is, is uh, far in the future. So we've got to keep the pressure on. And I think that uh, when we look at how we keep the pressure on again, uh, if you look at the SOCOM model right now, you see them enabling others to do their job. We provide niche capability, we provide training. Yes, we have some hit teams out there, but what we have to do is learn to do this by, with, and through allies and partners who actually know the ground, and keep it as an economy of force effort on our side, because this is something that has to be addressed. You cannot walk away from it. 
But when you look at the French-led effort in the Sahal, Operation Barkane, you see a brilliantly led effort. It's not got a lot of Western troops in it. We support the French leadership, as do the Germans and others. But I think what you're seeing there through, through three different French administrations is a kind of sustained effort that we and the American forces and the American intelligence community need to see as one of our strengths to support this sort of thing. Let them take the lead, help them. Make sure we've got good teamwork there on the ground. I don't think there's a way you can turn and walk away from this and hope it doesn't happen again. We've actually been through that. We did it after World War I on an international basis. It didn't work. We learned after World War II, we didn't do it anymore. We then learned the lesson the hard way coming out of Afghanistan, an operation you were intimately involved with, but then we didn't seize the victory and exploit it. And the result was, again, we learned a hard lesson. Hopefully we learned the lesson and now we keep the pressure on. But I think too, uh, that as we look at these key roles by allies, uh, we have got to reward them with our attention, with seats in our schools. We've got to build the, the people uh, relationships. And this is the area where SOCOM is absolutely magnificent at doing, is building these relationships that continue over time. And I think it's a very good idea what the Army is doing now with these, uh, these brigades they're putting together oriented on helping others as well because we don't want to overuse the SOCOM units for this. If, it's, if we want to teach them first aid and there's not a lot of relationship building, just kind of building capability, well, we, we've got soldiers who can do that. You, you've, got to, you've got to make a good balance is my point here and don't get so caught up in it that you lose the high-end capabilities due to the hot, the op tempo, the depth tempo. I certainly agree with everything you've said about alliances. It's really a unique source of strength. Uh, and it's been one since our nation's founding, uh, even though for the 19th century, uh, once we had our independence, we didn't um, need them for a while, but we sure did during the 20th and will in the 21st. You famously said that if you're going to a gunfight, bring lots of guns. And I think that sums up uh, grand strategy and allies. Um, so let's turn a bit to the domestic threats before we move on to our other topics. You know, our oath to the Constitution requires us to defend it against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And you and I have spent our lives focused on the foreign enemies. And, you know, as you mentioned, uh, with your shock of the events of uh, 6 January, never in our worst nightmares did we imagine that we would witness an insurrection against our government incited by some of our top um, leaders. So going forward, what do we need to do to defeat this um, domestic threat? And then more broadly, what do we need to do to restore a greater degree of unity, which you highlighted earlier uh, in your remarks, uh, to strengthen the domestic bases of our power? You know, I think one of the first things we have to look at is what was the root cause of this, just like we'd look at a problem overseas. And globalism hasn't been altogether good in large parts of our country. And when people are losing hope, we've got to go back and look at the economic situation and make sure when we go into certain trade deals that those trade deals are dealt with if there are going to be second and third order effects inside our own country. So that is one piece of it because economics oftentimes give people the hope that their children have a good future. And that's a common, common thing. And they're much, people are much more inclined to listen to, to uh, conspiracy theories and other things if they're losing hope. But more than that, you know, I go around and I teach now at universities. And as I look at the way American history is taught in our public schools, in many of our universities, I'm not sure how much affection I would be building uh, in my students the way it's being taught. Now, I believe in teaching the good, the bad, and the ugly, and our country was born with a birth defect uh, that we imported from the old world. It's called slavery, and we are still dealing with the after effects of it. But at the same time, uh, America, I've often learned most about America through foreigners. And you take a look at the greatest generation coming home and a young graduate student asking Harry Truman what he was proudest of when uh, then Henry Kissinger knocked on his door 
said, what were you proudest of as president? He said, Truman said, we whipped the fascists and then we welcomed the German, the Japanese, the Italian people back into the community of nations. We put together Bretton Woods and what you and I know as the IMF and the World Bank, that sort of thing. And that way, if uh, people were losing hope, they didn't have to turn to a, a fascist to make the trains run on time. They could, they could uh, have a lender of last resort. But I was talking once to uh, an ambassador there in Washington, D.C., and he said, and America made the single most self-sacrificial pledge in world history. I thought I knew American history. And I said, oh, you mean the Marshall Plan? He said, oh, no, no. He said, that just shows how uniquely generous that America is. No victor has ever done that before. It helped the, the adversaries get back on their feet. I said, well, what was it? And he said, after World War II, you could have looked at Europe and said, that's twice in 25 years you dragged us into this stupid war of yours. We're through with you. We're going with Africa, Latin America, Asia. You're on your own with the group of Soviet forces, Germany. He said, instead, the Americans... The Americans pledged 100 million dead Americans in a nuclear war, basically to protect Europe for a European democracy in Western Europe. He said, you didn't have to do that. And it took a foreigner to teach this to me. And what am I saying here? How many of us are brought up with this today with a love for America? How many of us realize we have no ordained right to exist, that every generation has had to fight for this freedom, this what George Washington in his first inaugural called an experiment. And remember, the lady asked Ben Franklin, what did we have coming out of the Constitutional Convention? He said, a republic, if you can keep it. Francis Scott Key held hostage on a British warship in Baltimore Harbor, writes a poem, and it says, oh, say, does that star sex spangled banner yet wave? Is it still up there? Uh, President Lincoln, 50 years later at Gettysburg saying, we're, we're testing now if a nation so conceived like this can even exist or will it perish? Yeah. Yet we don't hear that anymore. There's this sense that we've just got it. Yeah. And we've got to get back to that and understand how precious this is. And I don't need to tell anybody on this video that most of you have more time deployed in harm's way than I've got. And I've got a lot. But I think that this is not coming through and what we need, that museum, for example, that we're trying to build, we need it built because there was a Greek poet 2,500 years ago, a guy named Pindar, smart guy. And he said, left unsung, the noblest deed will die. And when I think of the noble deeds of so many of our SOCOM, of our CIA guys, OSS, these stories need to be told, that people put their lives on the line, that women and men jumped out of airplanes over occupied France, knowing they were dead if they got caught, and they went in to, uh, to fight fascism. We've got to go back to our first principles, a book Tom Ricks just published about our first principles, and we better start treasuring them and protecting them like they're as precious as they are, because we owe that to the next generation. I'll get off my soapbox. But no, I think that, that, that's great. And in fact, uh, it, it's interesting you mentioned uh, uh, my good friend, uh, Tom Ricks, I've known for decades. Uh, you know, the American founders were very influenced by Republican Rome and adopted a lot of their thinking about the Constitution from the, the good and the bad from Republican Rome and how they lost the Republic. And, and they knew that Republics could, could perish. Uh, the Romans themselves, you mentioned about history, and while you, you certainly can't ignore uh, the bad sides uh, of history and the problems uh, to correct, the Romans emphasized strongly exemplary history to show again the good and the bad, uh, what, what leaders when they really stood firm behind the Republic and then when they betrayed the Republic or didn't live up to the ideals of the Republic. And I think that's probably something we need to capture again. So let me turn a bit to um, uh, warfare and your experience. You know, as I mentioned uh, to our audience earlier, you know, you uh, led in combat at the battalion, brigade, and division levels, and then oversaw combat in across the theater in multiple uh, areas of operation in, in CENTCOM. Um, one of the interesting things from your book is when you were commanding a brigade in Afghanistan, you requested to be redeployed 
uh, to eastern Afghanistan in the end game of the initial invasion uh, to prevent Osama bin Laden and the rest of Al Qaeda leadership that was holed up with him from escaping into Pakistan. And General Franks uh, disapproved it. And you thought that was the wrong decision. And had he redeployed your force uh, to the Tora Bora Mountains, um, uh, it might have been different in our long hunt to bin Laden. Could you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, it really comes down to a philosophy that gets beaten into your head, I think, in the Naval Service, and I imagine elsewhere, about valuing intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, you know, we had moved against Kandahar. Uh, we'd linked up with the Army Special Forces team there. We had the Navy SEALs. We had people from 11 nations. We had uh, Canadians and Norwegians. We had Germans. They were on our side this time. It was a good thing. Uh, we had Jordanians and Turks, New Zealanders and Australians, UK. We had all these folks there, and we had the Marines there with their with their helos. And the intel came in, very good intel, and uh, obviously we knew the sources and methods that Osama bin Laden had retired, so to speak, to one of two valleys. Um, as soon as I saw it, I, I told the Marines to get ready to go, brought everybody in. And, uh, you know, I didn't command all those other forces, so I, I dropped the aerial photos on the table there. And I said, we think Osama bin Laden's up here. And I said, what do you want to do? And the Australians right away said, we've been up in the area. We can do the strategic reconnaissance. And the Marines said, we can lift everybody in on our heavy lift helicopters, surround it, that sort of thing. Um, the uh, Navy SEALs said, we just want to go fight. Normal intellectual approach the Navy SEALs have. Uh, the Germans said, hey, we haven't been in a fight yet. I said, that's fine. Since you're on our side this time, you're good to go. Uh, you know, this sort of thing. The CIA said, we got guys you want to ride on a helicopter from the Afghan forces. I said, count them in. They're good to go. Uh, so we, we're putting all this together. I studied the Geronimo campaign in my younger days, and I saw how the U.S. Army had outposted with heliograph stations along the southwest border. So we did a quick computer study in Maryland, and it showed where to put the observation posts along the border. So nobody, they were in sight of each other so nobody could slip through. And so you put a platoon or so on each, each one, put, put some mortars on it, Ford Air Controller, JTAC, and some snipers. And basically you move up the valleys and you push everybody up, up into it. We we're pretty sure it could work. I think the biggest problem was I had shifted from being under Navy command and control to being under Third Army. Mm. And where admirals kind of go with commander to commander, uh, the Army approach is much more staff-centric. Uh, and I just assumed, of course, we'll get the order to go. I'd put out the word that we're ready to go on my daily sit rep and this sort of thing. But there was also an effort to try and have the locals do it. I don't think they understood the locals there were Pashtun and the people they were bringing in to do it were Tajiks. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you've spent any time there, you knew this wasn't going to work, that we were probably seen as less foreign to the Pashtun and the Tajiks in that point. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, bottom line is we, we didn't do it. We could have outposted with probably no more than about nine outposts. We had enough to do, uh, I think 23, but nine outposts and then move up the valley with, uh, with sweeping forces. And I think we could have got them, but who knows, uh, you do, do what you can, but I think we missed a hell of an opportunity because the Intel guys uh, were very, very firm that they knew which that he had in one of two valleys. You know, always a student of history, I'm not surprised you uh, took inspiration from the uh, Geronimo campaign. And I, I know you recall that uh, Geronimo was the code word for Osama bin Laden uh, killed in action when we uh, finally got him. Um, so I wanna ask two more questions about warfare and then, then I think we'll turn to leadership. Um, one of your key initiatives as Secretary of Defense was to try to dramatically improve the capabilities of our close combat forces. Why did you make this a top priority and how are we doing in this area? Yeah, back when I was a commander at Quantico as a three-star, an army, a retired army general, Bob Scales, Major General Scales came in to see me and he laid out some data. I always like starting my discussions on problems, uh, start with data and then apply military judgment after that. And he showed that somewhere around 85% of our casualties since World War II have been taken in infantry units. 
Uh, now, they might be truck drivers or engineers assigned to an infantry unit, but basically they're in the infantry organizations. And I had to sit there and think about it. I've seen the, I've been in simulators a bit in the Marines with for F-18 pilots where you literally believe you're in an airplane. I mean, it's just so, it's so real. Uh, I've been on board uh, simulators in the Navy for the surface Navy, where you can feel the deck shifting under your feet, uh, that sort of thing. And yet we had nothing to give the young soldiers, SEALs, Green Berets, Marines, a sense of their first firefight. And, I, and I'd gotten to the point of seeing people die in firefights with the conviction that if I could get a young Marine through his first three firefights alive, his chances of surviving went up significantly. Now, there's always random, in close combat, there's always random uh, things that happen but I'd seen too many guys die just because they were still learning. So why couldn't we put together the simulator to simulate the ethical and the tactical decision-making before they were in their first firefight? And when you add to it the advances in sports medicine and nutrition, when you look at the way we were outfitting people, almost as beasts of burden where heavier and heavier loads were on them, there was a great opportunity to bring American technology to bear. It had not happened is the bottom line. I think that a World War II general watching me prepare 1st Marine Division for the fight in Iraq would look around and say, you know, your rifles look a little different and what are these things, these helicopter things, but pretty much uh, for the young infantrymen closing at, seeking out, closing with and destroying the enemy, a lot, he'd say, yeah, it looks, looks a lot alike. That would never happen in the aviation or the maritime forces. So we wanted to bring that in. And I thought the way to do it was to make it such a priority that it, it, it was equally addressing the Army infantry from light infantry to mechanized infantry, from Green Berets to Navy SEALs to Marines, uh, all of the close combat. And by the way, we also had international flavor because I believe in yes, foreign not no foreign. Uh, I wanted foreign forces in. So we had Israelis, we had uh, British Army and Royal Marines. We had French input. I mean, I, I just think it's the right thing to do. When 85% of your casualties are coming there, it's time to put your money where your mouth is, your attention, attention where it ought to be. Well, of course, uh, some of our adversaries uh, with different uh, or, or less rigorous ethical constraints or experimenting with human uh, augment performance augmentation to make super soldiers. And so if we don't pay attention to advantages that we can pursue in close combat, we, we can find ourselves in a world of hurt. So another let me ask one final on that, question. Mike, Mike, if I could, another point on that, as technology sweeps around the world and technology differences uh, are so quickly our advantages are eroding so quickly. The human factors are going to become increasingly important. And this is where SOCOM really sets an example for the other forces. Uh, they, have, they have prioritized this for it, part of their DNA. And so this is not some, some uh, you know, short-term fad. This is a sustained effort by SOCOM that we had better see copied across our force especially in the area where we take most of the casualties. Please go ahead, I interrupted. No, that's great. Uh, great great point exactly where I was going, which is to look at the uh, uh, man versus machine in future warfare. And you know, a number of analysts think that uh, autonomy will become increasingly important as you get intelligence machines. Um, how do you think that will shape future warfare? Well, I think one thing that won't change is it'll be the skills of the individual troops that we see more and more prized today over the raw numbers of the industrial age armies. Mm. Uh, that a few troops with, with the, the top line skills will have an influence far beyond what any squad leader in World War II, Korea, dare I say Iraq 2003 ever could have forecast because the change is coming so quickly. I think too, the knowledge of what's over the next hill in all ways, the enemy's knowledge of us, our knowledge of them over the next three hills, over the next 23 hills, 
it's going to make for a much more deadly and unrelenting battlefield. Again, the human factors are going to be essential uh, that we not lose sight of that. Uh, another point is it's not just about the technology. And here I was recalling that the French had better tanks in 1940 than the Germans, but they had not integrated new tactics, techniques, and procedures until the Germans waxed them there in the opening uh, days of World War II. We have to remember it's how we integrate that technology. How do we integrate the domains of cyberspace and outer space into what we're trying to do? And I think there's a lot of good things going on here right now. But when you get into the autonomous systems, two points. One, how many years have you and I been promised we could buy a self-driving car next year? And I, I think it goes back about 15, 20 years now. Um, I still haven't seen, I live right on, right on Sand Hill Road in Silicon Valley, right there on the road. <clears throat> and you see the little posts up with all the little things that the self-driving cars are gonna key off of. Every time I see one of them with all those antennas, there's this big fat guy sitting there and there ready to grab the steering wheel and hit the brakes too. Yeah. So we're not there yet, but here's the bigger issue. I've always said that you can change the character of war with technology. And I, um, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not some guy who doesn't like technology. I want it to be reliable and I want it to really be integrated. But the fundamental nature of war was what it was. It was fear and courage. It was skill and mistakes, all those things. What happens if we remove fear using robots, using autonomous systems? What happens to the fundamental nature of war? How do you stop a war where your weapons of war are no longer in human beings' hands and fear is no longer a consideration? You know, for thousands of years, poets, philosophers, eventually lawyers were writing rules of the road that we live by as civilization went up its, its ascent. What do you do today where technology is going so fast, it's out in front of legislation, in front of poets, philosophers, lawyers. How do you get control of this so we're not seeding our own destruction here? And we could do it on this planet. We all know the weapons exist now. Uh, so I, I just think it's interesting how we come to grips with this. And I don't have the answers, but I think it's gonna be one of the big challenges that the people who don't have my color hair are going to have to deal with in the near term. Um, so we're to allow a little bit of time for a couple of audience questions, and we've got uh, almost 40 of them right now. Um, let's talk briefly about uh, intelligence and special ops and then uh, close with leadership. Um, during the Cold War, CIA in particular and intelligence more broadly played a significant role uh, uh, in that conflict, keeping the Cold War cold in some cases by peering in, peering behind the Iron Curtain and, and running very effective espionage operations uh, and then uh, and, and breaking codes uh, and then using covert action, including Afghanistan to actually go toe to toe with the Red Army and, and, and defeat it. What, uh, uh, how important do you think intelligence, um, special operations and covert action will be to this new period of great power competition? Well, Mike, I think the first thing to do is put that question inside a framework. And the framework I would give is when I became the, uh, the Secretary of Defense, we all know what the technical job, you know, you're responsible for the, the military and it's training, equipping, it's operations, that sort of thing, civilian control of the military, no deployment goes without your signal. Okay, I got that. My real job, <clears throat> my real job description was how do you keep the peace or what passes for peace? Yeah. One more year, one more month, one more week, one more day, one more hour, so the diplomats can work their magic. Yeah. Or when they're in negotiations, they're, they're seen in a position of power. So when you look at that, what is the role of intelligence? It's to make sure that you're not stumbling into something stupid. You know, every second lieutenant in the infantry anywhere, the first thing he's told by his platoon sergeant is say, okay, lieutenant, we don't do stupid. That's the going in proposition. 
Some people haven't got the word in Washington, D.C., so I admire you, Mike, for staying in that area. But overall, that's what you try to do. So intelligence, number one, recognize what we have. I'm probably one of the few generals in history that can say with six years as a, as a four-star general, on not one occasion was I surprised on a strategic or operational issue that my intel people hadn't already told me. Number two, there was a wise former undersecretary of defense for intelligence who told me in a seven page handwritten letter as I went in, make sure you take the PDB every day and home or abroad, foreign, country, foreign nations where I had to go in to see the CIA station chief. I took it every day, Mike, I lived up to your guidance. <laughs> but if you don't take that intel and act on it, it, it's just another thing. So one other thing I did was I took a CIA officer who I had known at CENTCOM, brought her in to my office. And in every meeting with every foreign leader, every phone call with a foreign leader, with every meeting with my own staff or the Joint Chiefs of Staff, she was sitting there listening to all of it. The CIA referred to her as the highest level penetration of the Office of Secretary of Defense in history. But she, after a while, knew what I needed and she was constantly calling through so that I would get the intelligence that at times I didn't even know was out there that would help me. And you've got to be as ruthless in searching out information in today's age, I think, uh, with all the intel that we have available to us, as you were as a second lieutenant with closing with and destroying the enemy. If you don't have that sense, then you're letting down people who are trusting that you're doing your freaking homework and, and you're going you're gonna to fill body bags because you didn't do your homework. So it, it, I think the intelligence becomes more important now, Mike, because our, our uh, overmatch is shrinking. We're going to have less warning, I think, in the future. Uh, I think right now for every dollar that someone wants to take down the DOD budget, and I'm not recommending that, that dollar needs to be added to the intel budget and the special operations budget. Because if you don't do that, you're removing your shock absorber so that you won't have the time to react to the surprise. And I, I just think uh, if you go back to, uh, to uh, the, uh, the great strategist Gray uh, out of UK who recently passed away, mm -hmm. the foreseeable future is not. So you better have your intel people at the top of their game. All right. Um, so let's ask a couple of questions about uh, leadership uh, uh, across a range of uh, command. And then, uh, then we'll take a few audience questions and wrap up. So we have a lot of uh, West Point cad uh, cadets, uh, Naval Academy midshipmen, ROTC cadets uh, listening in this evening. Um, what advice would you have for our emerging direct leaders, those who would directly lead troops in combat? Yeah, uh, it's a great question, Mike, because it's the one I probably get asked most by the young guys, young gals. And I think the first point is, listen to your non-commissioned officers, your chief petty officers. They don't expect you to do everything they tell you they recommend. They do expect to be heard. They do respect you, but make certain that you've got, you're, you're a good listener. And that doesn't mean you walk in, let's say, thank you. I'm gonna go do what I was gonna do now. It means you walk in, listen with a willingness to be persuaded. They were getting a master's degree in your line of work while you were still in high school. So listen to them. Um, next, be as physically tough as your toughest troops. There is no way that you can walk in there and not be physically at the top of your game and expect that uh, physical rambunctious young troops are going to respect you. And they really don't care that you read von Clausewitz or some other dead German. Yeah. They're gonna assume you know how to call artillery support, yeah. but don't try to wow them with your knowledge. If you can't keep up with them on any run or outrun them, if you can't do as many pull-ups as your toughest troops, because they're just not built that way. They, they, they gotta know that the toughest coach in the ball game is theirs and he can, he can, or she can stand the strain. Another thing is, I think, make certain you know your troops. 
don't give up one ounce of your authority, but come as close to the line that must necessarily separate you from your troops and, and know not just, just their name, but what are their hopes? What are their, what are their goals? Do, do, are they want to stay in the army or are they going to get out? Uh, do they want to save money for a car? Are they going to go to college someday? Where are they going to live? The more you know about the troops, the more they know you care about them as individuals and the less apt they are to let you down when they're out of your sight. They just know that the bond is too close. So know your troops well, listen to your NCOs, and be as physically tough on the military skills, be as handy with small arms, be as, as, as good as your toughest troops. And I think that's probably about enough uh, wisdom from an old general. Uh, well, uh, pl uh, pl I was scanning through some of the, the many questions we have and a plebe at uh, West Point um, said, first off, he wishes he could buy you a beer. And then second, uh, uh, asked about words of wisdom you would giving uh, you'd give a developing soldier and leader. I think you I think you answered that. So let's turn on to uh, strategic leadership. Our friend Lloyd Austin has blazed the trail as the first African American to lead the Department of Defense, but he's also followed a path that you trod, going from CENTCOM commander to SecDef after an, an interlude in the private sector. So just from your own experience, what are some of the unique challenges in transitioning from senior military officer to defense secretary? Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. He, he, I hope he's not in quite the same situation I was in terms of his, uh, his superior, frankly. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, uh, when I came in, I, you know, I sat down on that first day noon on a Saturday with the vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Paul Selva, U.S. Air Force, uh, Joe Dunford, Chairman, and the holdover officer, uh, Bob Work, the Deputy Secretary of Defense. And I said, you know, gentlemen, I asked for this, the, the, uh, the National Defense Strategy for the last 30 days, and I couldn't order you to give it to me. I'm just happy nobody on the Senate confirmation hearing asked me about it. But I got two letters next to Ken coming in the next couple of days that are circulating up from uh, people we lost last month before I got here. I said, I need to know the strategy. And the chairman looked me in the eye and said, we don't have one. And we haven't had one in 10 years. So this is not, a, this is not slamming one political party, uh, covered two political parties there. So I went home that night and threw my bags in the corner of the house I rented and started writing a strategy at that point. But it was a strategy-free environment. It is not that now, and I'm hoping he can adjust off the strategy with that, that we've written, the National Defense Strategy. <clears throat> but I do have a concern that over the last 25 years, we've over-militarized our foreign policy, and he is going to have to deal with that. I sat down with Rex Tillerson, just a couple old guys getting to know each other, and I said, look, We've over-militarized it for 25 years. I think we need to get you back in the driver's seat of foreign policy. I'll tell you what the military can and cannot do, but this is crazy what, what we're doing these days uh, and, and it's hurting us. So we met before every single, uh, every White House meeting every week uh, we met, we ironed out our differences. We were committed to never walking into the White House uh, with them having to referee between state and defense. Uh, we, we were united all the way through uh, as we avoid this over-militarization. Probably the most important thing is making certain we define the end state of what we're doing. And this goes to Einstein's point, if given one hour to save the world, how would he compose his thinking? He said, I'd define the problem for 55 minutes and then I'd save the world in five. Yeah. Too often we're not doing that and it leaves the uniform military in a tough circumstance. Especially today, we are going to have to go into a more maritime strategy. That's that simple reality on the planet Earth. It's gonna be more maritime. So as you look at these deployments, there's actually going to be more danger coming up in the future. That can be anticipated. It, it's mostly arithmetic. I can go into why it is and uh, geography and time distance factors. But I think what you need to do is, is make certain you know how you're going to define the problem. And for the secretary himself, I wrote a card out when the first orders book came in that first week, every three days about in comes an orders book and every ship that deploys has a SecDef 
uh, signature, every army brigade that deploys, every Air Force squadron. <clears throat> and so I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, how do I, how do I go about this? Now, I'm no longer just the cheery, aye, aye, sir, I gave him my opinion. Now I've got to really say, is this the right thing or not? So I wrote, hand wrote a card and I never had it typed. I wanted it handwritten in big letters and I taped it to my stand up desk. And it said, will this deployment contribute sufficiently to the well being of the American people to justify the death of these troops, these soldiers, sailors, airmen, Coast Guardmen, Marines? And, and then I went through the book and I kept that card on that desk and I'd usually sign off. They were well put together, consistent with the strategy. Yes, yes, yes. Oops, chairman, please see me, you know, this sort of thing. And I think it's really important right now as we go through this you know, almost an inflection point in history that we go back to first principles about why we're deploying to support allies, to get strategic depth, to expand expand the competitive space against our adversary. Don't pit strength against strength. Put your strength out there where they can't confront it. And I think that in these cases, what we're going to see is General Austin is going to have his hands full because we're going back to the more traditional approach of working alongside allies. Mm -hmm. And he's going to have to restore that sense of normality to it, that this is the way we do things. And I, I, but I think too, that the other countries are really, really ready for that sort of thing. So I don't think it's going to be something that's at all difficult knowing his pers person to person skills, uh, he'll restore a, a pretty good sense of calm and confidence. Um, well, I, we run a little over time, but I promised we would take at least a couple of questions uh, uh, from the audience. We actually have almost 70. Uh, so let's at least do two or three and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, so one of them is you have a reputation for being a voracious reader and the audience can see some books on your bookshelf there. What are you reading these days and what, what struck you the most? What are a couple takeaways uh, from uh, what, what most is uh, impacting you? Yeah, I, I just finished a book by Susan Eisenhower about how Ike led, just what was Eisenhower's uh, method of leading uh, it was a very, very good book, uh, very eye-opening about how he became the, the president of everybody, including those who had not voted for him, uh, and how, how, how does a leader actually build the kind of alliance he took ashore at Normandy and, and, and destroyed uh, the Nazi's army. Uh, so that was, that was a very good one, to tell you the truth. I really enjoyed it. Um, and I've, I've got a number of others. Right now, I've pulled out Mandela's Long Walk, uh, his, his book, because I'm very concerned about how do we bring America back together. And there are leadership uh, lessons to be learned. And very quickly, his are some of the best because he was taking a nation torn apart by a century of apartheid and literally murder, I mean, uh, you know, civil war and brought it back together, uh, which, which is pretty phenomenal. But also I'm studying Martin Luther King on that and the civil rights movement. Ulysses Grant as president, very different understanding of it with the latest book, Chernow book on him, uh, and trying to come up with ideas of how was it that, for example, Mannerheim put Finland's society back together twice in his lifetime, one to 1918 uh, to 1922, and again in 44 to 46, where Finns had fought each other in, during those periods. So I'm, I'm trying to do more to understand how do we bring our country back together right now, and both the Eisenhower book and the looking at leaders who re, uh, repaired societies, they've been, they've been uh, really interesting to read. It can be done is the bottom line, folks. Take heart. We can do it. Amen. All right. Um, got another question from a midshipman at the Naval Academy who aspires to be a Marine officer uh, and asked, uh, before you became a second lieutenant, uh, what do you wish you knew that you didn't? Boy, um, I mean, I was overseas 21 years old as a second lieutenant. I only went to college for three years, Mike, which is why it's good we have a PhD on here too. Um, and I think it would probably be that I'd always imagined growing up that I'd have some job that I liked all the time. 
And then I got into the Marine and I came to hate certain things like minefields. I couldn't stand the damn things. But you know what I learned there, young midshipman? I learned that I'd rather have a tough, even an ugly job and be around the greatest group of human beings I'd ever run into, the sailors and Marines, who would, as much as I hated minefields, they'd bite their lip and they'd probe their way into a minefield looking for something they didn't want to find so their buddy didn't get killed. I found a degree of that, that I'd rather have a terrible job and be around great people. And I've, I've never looked back. I've, I've, I've never felt any regret about staying in the Naval service and serving with our, our soldiers, our airmen, our coast guardsmen, sailors and Marines. Uh, I, I wish I'd known then to value the people side because it took me a while to even realize that's what I'd done in my mind. I, my heart had gone that way and I'd followed my heart, but it took a while for my mind to catch up, which considering I'm an infantryman probably doesn't surprise anybody, but uh, it did take me a little while to realize that. And, uh, but I was, I was fortunate that my young sailors and Marines taught it to me uh, without even trying, just their, their daily rambunctious performance. Got me in trouble a few times, but uh, it was worth every bit of it. Well, we're 10 minutes over. Uh, General Mattis, uh, thanks so much for doing this, uh, for sharing your thoughts and for the wide ranging and engaging conversation. Thank you, Michael. Thanks everybody. And thanks for what you do. Keep the faith. Charles, over to you. Thank you, Mike. And thank you, Secretary Mattis. Now I'd like to spend a few minutes showing you the OSS Society's most ambitious project building the National Museum of Intelligence and Special Operations. Eventually, educational programs such as tonight's will be held in the museum's Oso oh Social Club, a bar that will serve as a gathering place for the special operations and, and intelligence communities. Because as a special operator once told me, every, op every operation starts or ends in a bar. And I'd like to show you a brief video about the museum, and we'd welcome your support in making this vision a reality. I used to look at the pictures of the people in the OSS, the guys that were in Detachment 101 or that were the Jed Bergs, were the people that were the foundation of the OSS, our history. And I always used to look at the faces and I looked at the eyes and what dawned on me was there's no difference between those people that were doing that as the greatest generation and the people that are doing it now. There's the same commitment, there's the same belief in country, there's the same love of what this nation stands for. Basically look at somebody and say, you need somebody to go, send me, I'm your person. The glorious amateurs from World War II's Office of Strategic Services have become today's quiet professionals of the U.S. intelligence and special operations communities. The National Museum of Intelligence and Special Operations will honor Americans who have served as our nation's first line of defense. It will educate the public about the importance of intelligence and special operations to the preservation of freedom. And inspire future generations to serve. It will be a museum unlike any other immersing visitors in what it takes to answer our nation's call. We have a unique opportunity to pay tribute to the silent warriors who fight in the shadows for us. By the very nature of their work, these silent warriors of the intelligence and special operations communities do their job out of public view. Their actions are vital to protecting our national security. The National Museum of Intelligence and Special Operations will tell their story of sacrifice and dedication and bravery. I ask you to join me in supporting this important effort. America needs this museum. The spearhead points the way forward. 
in the past, the present, and the future. Find out how you can help make this museum a reality and honor those who keep us safe. I'm honored to introduce noted author and cocktail historian, Philip Green. If you've attended the Donovan Award dinner in years past, you'll recognize Phil as the OSS Society's bartender, where he's presented the evening's cocktails from behind our replica of the bar from the Hotel Ritz in Paris that Ernest Hemingway and Colonel David Bruce liberated in 1944. After Phil presented the Leatherneck, a drink created by Marine Colonel Frank Farrell at last year's Donovan Award dinner, Secretary Mattis thanked him for glamorizing alcohol. We could not ask for a better or a better red bartender. He's the author of To Have and Have Another, a Hemingway Cocktail Companion, A Drinkable Feast, a Cocktail Companion to 1920s Paris, and The Manhattan, The Story of the First Modern Cocktail. When he's not writing books about cocktails, Phil's the trademark counsel for the United States Marine Corps. So please welcome Philip Green. Thank you. Can I have five more minutes? I'm almost finished with this book. It's can't put it down. I, so I have to. Uh, thank you very much, Charles, uh, Secretary Mattis. Uh, it's really an honor to be to be here this evening. And um, usually we have the drink at the uh, beginning of the event, but uh, we decided to do it at the end. So so be it. Uh, because tonight's seminar features a limited uh, a legendary Marine Corps general, uh, General Mattis. Uh, it seems fitting that tonight's drink have a connection to another legendary devil dog general, Major General Smedley Darlington Butler. Uh, general Butler fought in Mexico, Central America, and in World War I. Uh, at the time of his death, Butler was the most decorated Marine in US uh, Marine Corps history. By the end of his career, he'd received 16 medal medals, five for heroism. He is one of 19 men to receive the Medal of Honor twice, um, and one of three to be awarded both the Marine Corps Brevet Medal and the Medal of Honor, and the only Marine to be awarded the Medal of Honor twice. Obviously, General Butler, just like General Mattis, was, was um, anything but overrated. In fact, I don't think anyone would call either of those gentlemen the Merrill Streep of generals, but I digress, and I'll get back to General Butler in a moment. Now, this evening's drink will be the classic cocktail, the Gimlet, which has several ties to military history, particularly the British Royal Navy. You see that the small tool that the British like to carry barrels of, of rum or gin on board their ships when they went on long voyages to give a daily ration to the sailors. And the little tool that would tap each barrel was called a gimlet. So that might be the origin of the name gimlet. There's another theory out there that the name comes from Royal Navy Surgeon Admiral Sir Thomas Gimlet, who lived from 1857 to 1943. It's said that he was the first to introduce the idea of using a sweetened lime cordial to add to the daily dose of a ration of, of rum or gin that was given to the sailors, which, which the tradition went all the way up to 1970, believe it or not. Um, every day, the men would be given uh, a daily ration of rum or gin. Now, his name was Gimlet, and he, he uh, introduced the idea of using a rum cordial namely Rose's lime juice. This was patented in 1867 by a Scot named Lachlan Rose. So that could be the origin of the drink name, we're not sure. Now, the British had been, Royal Navy had been giving rum and or gin plus citrus and water to their, their sailors going all the way back to 1740 by an order from um, Ad, British Admiral Edward Vernon, which read from 1740, it says the daily allowance for the crew was to be mixed in a scuttled butt for that purpose and to be done on the deck and in the presence of the Lieutenant of the watch, who is to take particular care to see that the men are not defrauded of their full allowance of rum. And let those that are good husbandmen receive extra lime juice and sugar that it be made more palatable to them. A yeah, scuttled butt is another word for an old barrel, a disused barrel and because a lot of water cooler chatter would happen you know, in the afternoons when they were giving out the daily ration of, of rum, the term scuttlebutt probably comes from, from this practice. And while we're taking word origins for 500, Alex, 
I'll note that there's a pretty good chance that the, the British affection for citrus gave them the nickname limeys, but another word origin we'll, we'll never be entirely sure of. Now the gimlet was very popular with a couple of my favorite authors, and I understand General, uh, Secretary Mattis is a big Hemingway fan himself. You'll find the gimlet being featured in, in a couple of Hemingway short stories and, and uh, novel. It's in The Short Happy Life of Francis McComer, which takes place in Africa, as well as Green Hills of Africa. Um, Hemingway took Rose's lime juice with him on a safari because I guess limes would spoil in the hot African sun. And so you see the gimlet popping up in a lot of his writings. You also see it in the writings of uh, Raymond Chandler, one of my favorite detective novelists. Uh, there's a great scene featuring the gimlet in The Long Goodbye. The bartender set the drink in front of me with the lime juice that had a sort of pale greenish yellow misty look. I tasted it. It was both sweet and sharp at the same time. The woman in black watched me. Then she lifted her own glass towards me. We both drank. Then I knew hers was the same drink. It's hard to read Chandler and not think of, of Bogart. But, uh, and then there's a, there's a line later in the book where the Chandler character noted that a real gimlet is half gin and half roses lime juice and nothing else. It beats martinis hollow. I don't know about that, but it's, it's a great drink. And, and I hope you're, you're making one at home in a moment. So getting back to uh, General Butler, Smedley Darlington Butler, uh, there's a Marine Corps connection to the Gimlet as well. You see General Butler attained the nickname of Old Gimlet Eye during the Banana Wars. He apparently had a piercing glare through bloodshot eyes all the time. Now, was it because he was drinking? Was it because he was battling malaria down in Central America? At one point he had 104 degree fever uh, with a case of malaria. And he wrote a letter to his wife saying that he was drinking copious amounts of uh, quinine and limey. So maybe he was drinking gimlets, uh, maybe he was drinking gin and tonics, I'm not sure, but his nickname became uh, Old Gimlet Eye. So we're gonna make a gimlet for you this evening. Since this is, has the naval heritage, I'm gonna use my good friend Simon Ford's Forge Gin. This is the officer's reserve, naval strength. Uh, it weighs in at 109 proof. So um, this, this is quite a drink. Uh, to quote Napoleon, uh, this, this gimlet will be a iron fist in a velvet glove. So we're gonna start by, by chilling our cocktail glass. And this, this is the glass that was given out to attendees at um, the Donovan Award dinner in last year, 20 or 2019, when uh, Secretary Mattis received the Donovan Award. So we're gonna chill our glass with ice. We're gonna start with two ounces of the Ford's uh, Naval Reserve Gin. And then one ounce of Rose's sweetened lime cordial. Now, personally, I would rather use just a good old lime with some sugar, but if you're gonna make it authentic, it's gotta be with Rose's lime juice. Let's raise our glass and tip back our glasses to the tip of the spear. Here's to the immortal uh, General Butler who like General Mattis earned his spurs on the battlefield, not in a letter from a doctor. Cheers, everyone. Thank you, Phil. And I'd like to thank Secretary Mattis and Dr. Vickers for sharing their time and wisdom with us and for their selfless service to our nation. And I'd also like to thank all our sponsors again, Fiserv, the Walsingham Group, BCG Federal and Incatel, for the generous support of our OSO oh Social Conversation Series. To learn more about the OSS Society, please visit ossociety.org, where you can download a membership application form. When you join, you'll receive an OSS Society membership card, a replica of General Donovan's OSS ID card, as you can see on your screen. When we sent these cards out many years ago to our members, an OSS veteran returned it because he complained that the picture wasn't of him. An OSS staffer said General Donovan's imagination was so powerful, he could see an acorn and envision an oak tree. 
The OSS Society is planning to tell the story of how the OSS became the modern day intelligence and special operations communities by building the National Museum of Intelligence and Special Operations. The overhead rendering you see on your screen is what you'll see flying into Dulles Airport, which by the way, was designed by an OSS veteran, Aero Saarinen. And the museum will honor Americans who've served at the tip of the spear as our nation's first line of defense since World War II. To close this evening's event, we'd like to share with you an award-winning short documentary about the Marines who served in the OSS and General Mattis. It was produced for uh, the 2019 William J. Donovan Award Dinner, and I'd like to recognize the film's writer and director, Carl Colby. So thank you again for joining us and please enjoy the film. Like most young Americans in the 1950s, Jim Mattis idolized the American heroes of World War II. Generals Douglas MacArthur, George Patton, and Dwight D. Eisenhower, and Admirals Chester Nimitz, Bull Halsey, and Ray Spruance. But there was always a place of honor reserved for the tens of thousands of Marines who fought and were killed in the horrific battles of Saipan, Guadalcanal, and Iwo Jima. These were the Leathernecks, the Marines who hit the beaches first and planted the flag atop Mount Suribachi. Young American joins the army. The, that very day, he can call himself a soldier. If he joins the Navy, he's a sailor. Or airmen, same thing. But if a young person joins the Marines, he damn well better not call himself a Marine. He hasn't earned the title. And that's where the difference starts. If you're going to be a United States Marine, you damn well have to earn the title. And that's not easily done. This was the standard teenager Jim Mattis set for himself. Here are the stories of a few Marine Mavericks who likely inspired him and who fought valiantly with the OSS during World War II. Peter Ortiz, a French foreign legionnaire, parachuted twice into France as part of OSS Jedburgh Union Missions 1 and 2. Once when his team was surrounded, Ortiz surrendered to the Gestapo to spare villagers severe reprisals. Brutally interrogated, he revealed nothing. Ortiz was awarded two Navy crosses and was the most highly decorated Marine to serve in OSS. Recruited into OSS by General Donovan, Frank Farrell recruited Japanese American Nisei to convince enemy soldiers to surrender and local Melanesians to serve as coast watchers in the Solomon Islands. Chesty Puller said Farrell was the finest young Marine officer I ever knew. An anthropologist, Charlotte Chapman served in OSS as a Far East analyst and was recognized as a field researcher in the anthropology of warfare and terror, now known as applied anthropology. Charlotte retired as a Lieutenant Colonel and was the only female Marine to serve in OSS. Colonel Bill Eddy led OSS intelligence operations in the invasion of North Africa. General Patton, eyeing Eddy's many medals, said, I don't know who he is, but the son of a bitch sure has been shot at enough. Eddy was no saint, saying the OSS was in a death struggle with the Gestapo, and like Churchill, aligned himself with devils to survive. We deserve to go to hell when we die. Sterling Hayden was a lifelong sailor a free spirit. He became a Hollywood legend, starring in Dr. Strangelove and The Godfather. Operating an OSS Maritime Unit, predecessor to the Navy SEALs, Hayden sailed across the Adriatic to equip Yugoslav partisans, earning a silver star for his courage in making hazardous sea voyages and reconnaissance in enemy-infested waters. Jim Mattis is cut from the same cloth as these legendary OSS Marines. General Mattis is an extraordinary military leader, just has natural charisma, connects um, with his troops. He was a, you know, a truly legendary, inspirational, highly competent, sometimes profane, battlefield commander. 
Mattis was born in 1950 in eastern Washington. His mother had worked in Army intelligence, and his father had worked at a plant, supplying fissile material to the Manhattan Project. Mattis grew up as a rough and tumble Western, hitchhiking throughout the Pacific Northwest, climbing in the mountains of the Cascade Range and getting out of a few scrapes along the way. Mattis was fascinated by military history with a library of 7,000 books. He later drew up reading lists for his Marines and insisted they be familiar with the culture of where they were deployed. General Mattis uh, has been absolutely dedicated to the profession of arms, and he's used his passion for reading military history in, in particular, um, but history of various regions of the world and, and, and cultures as well, to inform his professional development and his career. During the Gulf War, Lieutenant Colonel Mattis commanded 1st Battalion, 7th Marines one of Task Force Ripper's assault battalions. Mattis later took command of the 1st Marine Expeditionary Brigade and earned his nickname, Chaos, an acronym for Colonel Has an Outstanding Solution. He would say, be polite, be courteous, have a plan to kill everyone you meet. And, and again, this actually does capture some realities, by the way. You actually do need to be polite, you need to be courteous, you need to be ready for a handshake or a hand grenade and ready to respond appropriately to either, and he absolutely got that. Marine officer Nathaniel Fick once saw Mattis sitting in a foxhole in Afghanistan talking with a sergeant and a lance corporal. No one would have questioned Mattis if he slept eight hours each night in a private room, woken each morning by an aide who ironed his uniforms and heated his MREs, but there he was, in the middle of a freezing night, out on the lines with his Marines. Particularly as a um, division commander in the invasion of Iraq in 2003, he was really known for speed and, and boldness of maneuver. Mattis commanded 1st Marine Division in the 2003 invasion of Iraq and the Iraq War. Mattis played key roles in Fallujah, negotiating with the insurgent command inside the rebel-held city. The unique ability that General Mattis had was to, uh, to actually ensure that his intent was conveyed down to the lowest level inside of a Marine Division. So in this case, we had more than 20,000 Marines fighting with the 1st Marine Division in Operation Iraqi Freedom. And I can tell you that every single one of those 20,000 individuals knew exactly what the commanding general expected and, uh, and was let free then to accomplish the mission. Mattis popularized the 1st Marine Division's motto, no better friend, no worse enemy originally chiseled into the epitaph of Roman strongman Lucius Cornelius Sulla. In 2010, Mattis was nominated by President Obama to replace David Petraeus as commander of the United States Central Command. As head of CENTCOM, Mattis oversaw Iraq and Afghanistan and worked to counter Iran, including ramping up covert operations and the disruption of Iranian arms shipments to Syria and Yemen. What also makes him unique, besides being one of our preeminent warriors of the past several decades, is he's a very shrewd grand strategist. He understands other elements of, of uh, national power. He's a big supporter of intelligence, uh, special operations forces, sees force as last resort, understands the relationship between force and diplomacy, and the importance of allies. In November 2016, Mattis was nominated by President-elect Trump to serve as the 26th United States Secretary of Defense. Mattis was quickly confirmed and took strong and principled positions throughout his tenure. He warned North Korea that any attack on the United States or our allies will be defeated, and any use of nuclear weapons would be met with an effective and overwhelming response. Mattis fought for U.S. troops to remain in Iraq saying, we go out of our way to always do everything humanly possible to reduce the loss of life or injury among innocent people. Mattis called the April 2017 Syrian chemical attack a heinous act and warned Syria it would pay a very, very stiff price for further use of chemical weapons. 
On December 19th, 2018, President Trump announced a full U.S. withdrawal from Syria. Mattis had said the U.S. would remain in Syria after the defeat of ISIS so that they did not regroup. The next day, Secretary Mattis submitted his resignation. His resignation letter praised NATO and the Defeat ISIS coalition. Mattis affirmed the need for treating allies with respect and also being clear-eyed about both malign actors and strategic competitors, and remaining resolute and unambiguous against China and Russia. I absolutely share Jim's view uh, that we want as many allies as we can. We want as many folks with guns from as many countries all there with us when the shooting starts. It's not always easy. Alliance maintenance, coalition maintenance is a time-consuming, sometimes painful task. But Winston Churchill was right when he said that the only thing worse than fighting with allies is fighting without them. General Mattis uh, was a student of history, and I think one of the takeaways he has from his study of history is that at the end of the day, leadership is about character. And, uh, and General Matt Mattis uh, in embodied uh, those characteristics of great leaders throughout history. James Mattis is hardcore and devoted to his Marines. He embodies Semper Fi. He displays the austere demeanor and stoic virtues of Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius, who said, waste no more time arguing about what a good man should be. Be one. In 76 years of being a Marine, I have never found one person to say to me, gee, I wish I hadn't been a Marine. They're all proud of it. They're brothers. They believe in something, something very special. It's right at the heart of this country.